Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. Uh, I was listening to a podcast uh, by a guy named Lex Friedman, who has two million followers. And I listened to parts of two, one with uh, economist Tyler Cowen, the other with uh, mathematician Stephen Wolfram. And I noted with interest, you know, that uh, he just went from topic to topic, uh, being reasonably intelligent throughout, um, in long form. His podcasts are three hours long, yet he has two million followers. So those of you who follow my work know I like to try experiments. So I'm going to, I'm not going to talk for three hours for sure, probably be a half hour to an hour. Usually my podcasts are, and, and YouTube videos are much shorter. But we're going to give it a try. Um, and I'll just try to say what I think are smart things. I, I don't, I've had guests on my NPR San Francisco show. I had many guests. but. My listeners said they actually liked it best when I just held forth myself. So I'm going to do that, which I've been doing on my podcast, and I'll do it again here. But this time, instead of being very focused on a given topic, I'm going to talk about a bunch of things. I've got to, I'll give you an idea of what I have planned here. I'm going to talk about uh, work, both from a societal perspective and an individual perspective, what people should do, can do, what, etc. I'm going to talk about automation and how it affects things. I'm going to talk about some insider baseball on career counseling and what I've learned over the years. Um, I'm going to talk about the meaning of life and my definition of it, for better or worse. I'm proud of that definition and uh, invite you to consider it. Um, and in, and I'm also, in, in the course of that, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about materialism and why I think it's... Uh, I'll just, I won't tell you, but my thoughts about materialism and its related things, pop culture and, and watching sports. I'm going to talk about merit, which is something that I believe is now under attack and I believe is ultimately, in the long term, the wisest criterion for selection of everybody from students to CEOs to the President of the United States. I'll talk about education. I spent a lot of time in education, uh, thinking about education. I'm going to talk about both how you can survive a deeply flawed system from kindergarten all the way through graduate school, and I'm going to talk about reinventing it. I'm going to talk about the conventional wisdom that peace is wonderful, and I'm going to talk about the case for violence. Um, um, everybody's talking about health care. I have a what I think is a bold idea for reinventing health care, and I'll also talk a little bit about how you can make the most of the system as it is. I'm going to talk about politicians, why I really... Uh, Unfortunately, our system almost guarantees that the best people don't run, and then there's tremendous pressures for them to be not their best. Um, I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of capitalism and communism. I actually am a centrist on all that. On that. Um, I'm going to talk about relationships. I'm going to make the case pro and con marriage, pro and con kids, pro and con venerating family over friends. I'm going to uh, lament our legal adversarial system that uh, is not only run by money so much, but uh, ends up being who wins rather than what is the truth. We'll talk, I'll propose an alternative. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm no libertarian, but I'm no big government guy either. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of government versus private sector and make a case for what I think is wisest. I'm going to talk about the three C's, cancel, censure, and censor. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, uh, the very narrow range of things that people can talk about without being uh, uh, labeled. Uh, the, uh, I absolutely believe that the, the wisest solutions long term come from the full exploration of benevolently derived ideas from the left all the way to the right and uh, across a matrix. Um, I'm afraid that we're quietly becoming as censoring as uh, the Stalin era, the Hitler era, and Putin. They may not be dragging us into a KGB camp or extermination camp like uh, Hitler, or the 20 million that Stalin killed, but uh, uh, the amount of censorship and uh, censorship and canceling is very frightening to me uh, because I do believe that knowledge is power. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, and as an example of that, is the way you cannot advocate for men and boys without being called a sexist, even though many more men are not going to college, not graduating to college, which is a complete change over a couple of uh, generations ago. Uh, they're failing to launch, and men uh, suffer the ultimate deficit. Uh, they die f uh, five years earlier and earlier of all time of the top ten diseases, yet all you, all the gender-specific, almost all the gender-specific funding is for women. Uh, that's one of the things that's very prone to be canceled and censured. And, uh, uh, 
I will talk about that. And finally, I will talk about the future. I will create a utopian vision. My, so if I'm optimistic about things, not utopian, my optimistic vision, my pessimistic vision, and then my best shot at a moderate vision. So you can see why that will take a, a good chunk of time. I can't begin to estimate how much it is. None of this is scripted. Frankly, none of this is planned. I'm trying to trust my 72 years on this earth. And frankly, my the, the brain that enabled me to read in a 12th grade level in the first grade, despite growing up in poverty to new immigrants and getting a PhD from Berkeley, uh, hopefully that mind and trying to be aware my whole life, I've very so much focused on liking to think about and write about and speak about issues. Hopefully that's enough that doesn't require me to do a whole lot of practicing in advance or any, I didn't do any, but the important things will hopefully have filtered up to the top of my brain. And with that, I welcome your staying with me as long as you uh, find it worthwhile. The beauty of the internet is there is an infinite number of options, podcast, videos, text, uh, TV shows, etc. So um, uh, watch and uh, listen as long as you find it worth your time. Okay, as promised, I want to start with the world of work since that's where I spent my most most of my time over the last 35 years. I want to talk about um, the the. I want to start with the macro issue of automation. Um, you know, it is easy to embrace worker rights. You know, wanting to have employer paid health care, employer paid workers' compensation, uh, uh, ever-expanding safety rights, rights around race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Um, and of course, each one of those has benefits. There's no black and white. Each one of those does yield benefit, but they also impose a cost, of which one of the major ones is that it raises the cost enormously of hiring people. Also, the media has made, uh, media and colleges are very critical of employers, especially in the for-profit sector. So it's perhaps not surprising that a, a, a new Gallup polls finds that more than 50% of uh, American workers uh, are quietly quitting. Uh, you know they don't they don't quit, but they are working less. And a UK study of 1,989 people uh, last year found that the average amount of actual work that the office work full supposedly full time office workers do is two hours and 27 minutes. The rest of the time they're spending on things like you know making food, chatting, checking the internet, etc. Um, and so automation, which to heretofore has been largely limited to uh, uh, some very mundane tasks, and we kind of uh, uh, say, well, that's okay because that's just going to take away the boring task. It's um, it's going to become ever more pervasive. Certainly in the fast food industry now with the new California law that's going to mandate, and I don't have the details right, but I think it's twenty-two dollars an hour plus benefits as a minimum. If that's not going to create incentive for companies to uh, create automated burger flippers and the like, I don't know what will, which will end up costing lots of jobs for the very people who are struggling uh, the most in an information economy. Uh, but it's also, I believe, that this uh, this antipathy toward the man, uh, which is a euphemism for corporate leadership especially and even nonprofit leadership, is going to uh, increase the tendency to uh, uh, automate even uh, uh, white collar tasks requiring judgment. Of course, it's not going to be AI. It's not going to be like little ETs are going to be sitting at desks, but there will be ever more AI assisted um, managers, leaders, etc. And if there is AI assisted, they'll be needing fewer managers and leaders. So that is also going to take a toll of jobs. I think that is that is real. I also think that um, because um, the world is getting more complicated and frankly, more collaborative, so that more people need to be taken into account. Coworkers, customers, vendors, uh, suppliers, the government, uh, the media, that ever more intelligence is going to be required to do all but those menial jobs, which again, were most easily automated. And so uh, uh, the, the smart, intelligence is a dirty word these days, but the smart are going to have a big advantage. Also. You know, given that there is ever more people quietly quitting, the people who have a, a strong work ethic are going to be ever more valued by employers. Um, and uh, so it is a smart and driven and ethical. I, well, I don't know, but you know, I, wi I wish that ethics would be primary, but I don't believe, uh, unfortunately, it is expedient. You know, people talk about kumbaya together, ethics, whatever. But I can say, having had thousands of career counseling clients in the confidentiality in my office, there is a remarkable amount of, uh, let's just say, moving to the back of the bus ethics. Um, I mean, saying that ethics is moved to the back of the bus, uh, bus and that, of course, uh, 
you know, a wink and a nod is too often the case. And I, that, you know, maybe it's easy for me who's self-employed and, you know, I'm not financially hurting for money for me to be sanctimonious and talk about ethics being primary. But I like to think that even if I were dirt poor, I would think that that is core to a well-running society and what I'd want myself and my daughter to do. Uh, okay, next, what do I want to talk about here? A uh, little inside baseball about career counseling. I love the field, but I don't like the ethics of it. You're this tremendous pressure. The people who tend to come to career counseling, especially those who pay for them, are people who are not making it well on their own. So they're, as a pool, they're less competent or less driven, or they have a, a, a problem, a mental illness problem, a drug problem, whatever. And so, but my job, if I am to satisfy my client, is I've got to, you know, and it is too extreme to say put lipstick on a pig, but I've got to make the person within the bounds of ethics look as good as possible, which of course makes me feel bad a lot of the time. And I know that saying this is going to help me lose clients, but I'm trying to put my ethics front for you. Because every time I make a client look better than they are, whether it be in, you know, massaging their resume or their cover letter or having them uh, come up with the right explanation for why they've been laid off three times in four years, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I am punishing a more worthy candidate who doesn't need all of that veneer, who can stand on their own merits. And that only not only hurts that more qualified candidate, but then hurts the coworkers who would, who get saddled with a worker who's less good than uh, than they could have. If my if I'm successful, if my client gets the job over that more qualified, more competent, harder working, smarter person, more ethical, more low maintenance person, um, those coworkers are suffering, suffer the result. The boss is suffering as a result. The customers are suffering a result, whether it be lower quality products or poorer customer service, whatever the hell it is. Um, and um, and then, you know, we call the stock, the, the shareholders evil. But most shareholders are people like, you know, who've worked hard for their money and are invested in their Vanguard index fund. And it's they're saving for college or retirement or whatever. And if we're hiring people, if I'm helping people get hired who are less competent, driven, ethical, etc. That's going to make their stock price go down and the value of people's college savings, retirement savings go down. So part of me feels crappy about the career I've chosen. The part of the career that I like, and I really try to prize now in getting new clients, I'm fortunate to have more clients than I, I have room to see, is to focus on people trying to make the most of their current job or to move up and improve their skills or their attitude or whatever. That's really what career counselors should really focus on, or career coaches or whatever, because that's purely ethical. That's helping somebody make the most of who they are. And so uh, there's my little tip there. Um, you know, it's very easy for me to be sanctimonious. I'm putting myself in the shoes of you have been laid off three times in four years. It is very tempting to use what is called euphemistically in my field, creative writing on resumes and inter answering interview questions. And in, you know, I, the worst example is I've had clients who can't get a good reference, and most people, even crappy employees, can use his girlfriend uh, as his main reference and, and had her claim to be his boss. You know, there's an incredible amount of bullshit that goes on in uh, in job applications and on the job and in sales and in fundraising, which is the nonprofit analog of sales. You know, uh, unfortunately, humankind. Much as we talk about kumbaya together and ethics, there is an inordinate amount of selfishness, including of people on the left, not just people on the right. I see that growing up, truly across the ideological spectrum. Um, now I want to talk about uh, the meaning of life and work's role in that. I will admit that I'm very unusual in this, but as I think about it, uh, and, and I've thought about it a lot, it is my belief that that the more of our heartbeats that we spend using our best skills to make a difference to our sphere of influence, the better our life is led. For me, the meaning of life is in that. And the metaphor I like to use is if there was a meter attached to your brain and that it scored it from minus 100 to plus 100, and every time you did something that was really potentially beneficial to society it would be 100, Anytime you did something terrible like sell crack, it would be minus 100. But it, across every moment of your life, for me, the life well led, the meaningful life is defined by your average score on that meter. Now, 
the standard view, especially today, is work-life balance. You are not a human doing, you're a human being. Let's just be, experience, feel. Your perspective is as good as anybody else's. Don't be too hard on yourself. All of that stuff, I don't buy any of it. I don't believe in unconditional self-acceptance. I don't believe in un undeserved self-esteem, that everybody has self-esteem, that they deserve self-esteem by virtue of their being human. I don't buy any of that. I believe that self-esteem is earned by how well you score on the meter. We've all made mistakes. We've all done bad things. We score on the minus side of the meter, no question. But your self-esteem, your worthiness, the meaning of your life, as far as I'm concerned, is defined by your average score on that meter. And the more you are closer to the plus 100, and almost nobody's close to 100, but the more you are in the heavy positive territory, let alone neutral, let alone negative, uh, the more worthy your life is. One guy's opinion, I invite you to ask yourself to what extent that's applicable to you. In any event, I'm going to take a little break. Uh, for those of you who are listening on this podcast, I need to let my announcer do her thing. Uh, I hope you'll stay with me for just a moment. Okay, um, thank you for staying with me. This is my uh, attempt to imitate uh, Lex Friedman, who has two million followers on his podcast, and he tends to go from thing to thing. He interviews people, but um, my listeners on my NPR show that I had for 30 years um, said they seem to like it better when I just hold forth. So that's what I'm doing here for you, and going from thing to thing, hopefully sharing my, my best and most absolutely most honestly presented ideas. There are some things I'm not allowed to talk about in this today's censorious world, but short of those, I'm trying to share as much as I can in full candor. Um, okay, so I want to talk now. I think let's move. Let's move to uh, uh, no. I want to talk just a bit about merit. Merit, as I said at the top of the show, is my most deeply held value. I deeply believe that whatever benefits come from reverse discrimination or any other hiring at some, you know, uh, the, a, uh, a legacy, a child, you know, getting somebody high, selected to a prestigious college because their parent went there. Anything uh, that is not merit-based is, is a nightmare for society. Even affirmative action, which understandably has its benefits, ultimately, when we use anything other than merit, that is their intelligence, their skills, their ethics, how driven they are, how low maintenance they are, that's what merit is. Unless we, every time we deviate from that and we use demographics, whether it's race, gender, sexual orientation, whatever, we are, we are making the world worse in the ways I described earlier. Worse products, worse services, worse, worse leaders, worse medical, worse medical care, worse everything, worse likelihood of, of curing diseases. There's nothing I believe more and you can disagree, and most people do these days because it's, you know, it's even what merit has been called a white male supremacist value. I don't give a shit, and I'm going to say that word shit. I don't give a shit if you're black or Latina or Latinx or, or uh, you know, gay or transgender, uh, Asian. I do not care in the slightest, but I do care about merit. And if you are, if you are being, there are, I believe, still some, but not many, cases in which one's race or gender is unfairly, um, they're judged unfairly because of that. I'll stand alongside them, absolutely. But more often these days, we see being in the quote, right demographic, being something that is given huge weight in addition to merit, and that is a, a terrible negative for society and reduces it to a lower common denominator. Now I want to turn to education. I have spent a lot of time in education, and I think it is America's most overrated product, all the way from elementary school through graduate school. I'll briefly say why, and then what I would do about it, and then how you as an individual can survive what is a horrible, in my judgment, expensive, wasteful system. Um, K-12 is horrible because it's one of the, we only see, I understand again the benefit of unions. You know, if, if, if the employer has all the power, workers tend to be treated poorly, although I love Trader Joe's non-unionized and I'm worried now that they're going to become unionized. But teachers, as the teachers you have long been unionized and their interest is not, despite their PR protestations to the contrary, primarily in educating kids. It is about protecting teacher jobs, even if the teachers are not that competent. It is about getting the workday short. 
why in this non-farming economy is the are the summers off why is the school day six hours and 20 minutes and those are only 100 and maybe 70 days or 165 days the rest are minimum days where the teachers get tra retrained on something that isn't going to be practical usually and it certainly would be better off if they were spending time with the kids the union guaranteed tenure lifetime tenure after two or three years even if you're a marginal teacher and they've created such onerous procedures for getting rid of a bad teacher that most principals just say I only have a certain amount of bandwidth I'm just going to let it go and kids suffer 20 or 25 at a time for decades outrageous that is a core part of the problem it's not money we spend number two roughly in the world on education and we score number 24 25 or 26 somewhere near Croatia in, in international comparisons it's not money we spend plenty undergraduate education the big problem there is that at the more prestigious the university the more professors are hired and promoted based on research and and uh, research not on how well they teach undergraduates and the skills to be a great undergraduate teacher are normally and the motivations are normally orthogonal that is opposite to what it takes to be a good researcher good researchers focus on the abstract cutting edge of their field undergraduates need introductions researchers are focused in the lab they're not about mainly communication what is required to be a good teacher not just communication but connection we do the opposite of what should be occurring and it's ironic and people don't believe me but the more prestigious the college the Harvards the Stanford's the the Princeton's the Chicago's their professors are hired and promoted based on their research especially how many dollars they bring in ironic that the best teaching on average is at a community college or at a small private college that doesn't venerate research or at a four-year small force four-year regional college that that is about teaching first that's the core the core problem with with undergraduate education and the same is true of graduate school professors are horribly they they love they got to do research it's by profession by by they it's by their preference as well as by the promotion and tenure requirements so what do they really care about in their graduate students not their classes they care about recruiting graduate students to be their their research slaves so that they don't have to do so much working in the, in the professor can get more articles that's not the way to train graduate students are quote best and brightest but now how do we survive it and then I'm going to share a, a dream idea uh, for for really reinventing education which I have has been the major initiative I tried to push and I've really worked hard at it trying I've spoken to state superintendents of schools I've spoken I've left voicemails and emails for the leading people in the uh, in, at the US Department of Education I've written articles for the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, many articles for other education publications and I've gotten absolutely nowhere the education blob is so inured so driven by stasis and unionization uh, that it's it's just it's just a cesspool um, I'll tell you about let me tell you about that now I really believe that the, we could transform education and make a huge difference help it live up to its promise if maybe starting say in the third grade fifth grade eighth grade who knows doesn't matter but if instead of the range of teaching I like to use the example of algebra there are I think 40,000 algebra teachers nationwide some are fabulous some are terrible most are in the middle but skewed bad because the people who tend to be good in math tend to be not the most verbal so you have a hard subject like algebra taught by a pool of 40 something thousand people who aren't the best and yet it's considered a gateway to college and a gateway to many careers in our ever more quantitative analytical society what if instead of that we had the classes taught by a dream team of the most transformational wonderfully instructive entertaining math teachers taught online in little modules one at a time individually paced using really wonderful demonstrations that are impossible for a t individual teachers 40,000 of them to create these demonstrations and, and, and visuals etc just imagine that kids would take that algebra course compared with and with individualized quizzes and you have to pass this module to get to the next can would you if you was your money and you had a thousand dollars to bet on two identical classes one of which was taught by a random teacher the other of which were these individualized modules which do you think would learn more algebra now multiply that by the nation by the world multiply that by all the subjects 
can you see why that would make a huge difference? But that would cost teacher jobs. And the union is all powerful. They put in millions of dollars to every political politician's campaign. So every, every politician is scared to buck against the union. Even conservatives, but of course liberals are absolutely have the, the unions have them in their hip pocket. Anyway, those are my thoughts on education. Now I want to talk about something controversial, controversial but important. Everybody talks about peace. Who could argue against peace? I remember hearing somebody counsel a, I'll just say, a, a, really a national political leader. He said, just use the word peace all the time. All you want is peace. All you want is peace. Well, you know, in reality, when you really look at what has worked, violence works. If we had not been the American Revolution, we might be still paying the stamp tax to the British and be ruled by the British king. If we did not have a civil war, we might still have slavery. If we did not fight with war against the Nazis, we might be saying Sig Heil and, and, and uh, um, under the dictatorship of the of a, a next group of Nazis. If we didn't fight Stalin, who killed 20 million people, and I know that the leftist media, our liberal media and our education whitewashes this. We all hear about Hitler. We don't hear about Stalin's 20 million people that he killed because he believed in the communist ideal. And believe me, I have some pro-communist views and some pro-capitalist views, but killing 20 million people for it? Violence works. Look at all the look at all the riots. I would say so the media would say protests in every city, burning down cities. Would Black Lives Matter and its entities and other black groups would they get all this positive attention and millions of dollars if it weren't for the rioting from from Rodney King to Ferguson to Oakland to Minneapolis? They even managed to defund the police by rioting. It's sad, but violence works. I was threatened for saying some of these things by, I have a social justice warrior, and she is a warrior, very anonymous. She uses a VPN, a virtual private network, to hide who she is and other things. But she has threatened my wife and myself for saying the kind of things that I've been saying here. So that works. It pretty much shuts me up. Turning to uh, medical, we all are care, concerned about health care. The costs are crazy. Our results are not that great. Some of that is demographics. It's not so easy to, to, to draw parallels with, the, with Scandinavia that has a very different population. Even Britain has, uh, it's, everybody knows that the National Health Service is broke, uh, and that's all they talk about is how we can keep it afloat. Uh, and in America, we have a, a system there where money is sucked out of the system by really Pretty, and here I'm pretty liberal, pretty horrible insurance companies who practice delay, 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 deny, 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 delay until the patient dies, require lots of paperwork, deny, pay as little as you can get away with, and patients are not getting the care they deserve. And doctors, who again, they're seen as the haves, they're getting shitty reimbursements. And with the huge amount of malpractice suits, they're paying a fortune in malpractice, our healthcare system, and, and, and the consumer has very little information to help them make a good choice. So if I were reinventing healthcare, this is what I would do. I would take the insurance companies out of it. That's an unnecessary source of friction, an unnecessary middleman. I would have government controlled healthcare, but control doesn't mean everybody gets the same level of care. The poor get every th a basic level of care free. No choice of doctors, you're gonna see nurse practitioners, Maybe physical therapy assistants, you're going to mainly outpatient. If you're in the hospital, you're going to be in a large ward, all that stuff. But you're going to get basic quality care, especially prevention, but even cure when needed. Everybody else has to pay. It's fee for service. And that way people will vote with their feet where to go, what to do. They won't overuse the system. And to help people make smart choices, they would have to be report cards on every practitioner, every doctor, every physical therapist, every every hospital for procedures weighted by the complications. So it's not enough to say, you know, 
X percentage of surgeries succeeded, or even X percentage of uh, of uh, heart tra heart transplant or or whatever cardiac stent replacements were successful. It needs to be risk adjusted because there are some patients who are older, sicker, etc., and so each one of those the average rating needs to be based on a weighted weighted on the difficulty of the procedure, the difficulty of the uh, the, the patient pool. That's my best idea for reinventing healthcare. Um, and I think the public would be would be would be comfortable with that. It's it's and they'd get a higher the people who are paying get a higher level of care. They do get their choice of doctors. They're more likely to see a doctor than a nurse practitioner. They're more likely to, to get maybe more extended uh, you know, amount of physical therapy if that's what's called for. Uh, few, even if they're not essential, you know, because they're paying in, they're going to get they'll get to have more sessions if that's what they they want. So that's my idea for reinventing. So um, I'm going to take another just a few second break if, from my, my announcer, if you're listening to this on a podcast, to say her thing. Uh, just going to be a few seconds. I hope you'll stay with me. I'm Marty Nemco. I'm attempting to, uh, I've been inspired by Lex Friedman, who has two million followers, and he goes from topic to topic to topic, just kind of... Uh, using his brain he does has guests whereas my my listeners from when i had my npr show for so long said they like it best when i just held forth and so that's what i'm doing with you here i won't talk three hours like he does i'm probably going to talk another 10 10 minutes something i'm guessing and then uh, get out of here for your so you're not listening to me forever um okay um politicians uh, you can't trust them and it's not necessarily their fault the system almost ensures that the best people don't run it requires a four year even for low level offices it requires a four year press the flesh campaign from the left you're pressing the flesh of unions and nonprofits uh, if you're on the right you're you're pressing the flesh of uh, uh, f corporate fat cats and other rich people um, and although I frankly the left also obviously uh, the left has become a, a big fan of uh, you know people like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, uh, Warren Buffett are lefties, and they so the left courts them too. But anyway, it's all about money, and it's all about campaigning instead of making a difference. And uh, so I have a solution that I love, uh, and which is it's it's based on the same way in which index mutual funds, index funds, ETFs, mutual funds have outperformed almost all. Uh, actively managed stock funds. It would work like this. Legislatures at both the state and federal level would be selected not by voting, not by democracy, because democracy these days is too easy manipulated by these spinmeisters who are very sophisticated messaging experts. Obama in 2009 had, I happen to know this for sure, had a 28 member, uh, what's it called? Um, hold on a minute, uh, I hate it. Camilla, I can't talk now. Um, we're supposed to meet. Hello? Yeah, Camilla, uh, are we supposed to meet today at? Uh, let's see, what time are we supposed to meet? I have three thirty. Yeah, three thirty right now. It's two thirty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to confirm. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, three thirty. Yeah, three thirty. I'm, I'm going to be in person. Okay. Okay, that's great. Bye, bye. Well, this is you know this is. Uh, you know, video or radio verite. Maybe my announcer will be able to excise this little little bit out. But I, I just wanted to keep going. Anyway, um, it's just a client. Well, not just a client. I care a lot about my clients. But anyway, I didn't want to be interrupted. Anyway, that's the story. Moving on. So um, yeah, what I would do would be, I, state and federal legislatures. I would um, focus on uh, identifying criteria not not for the there would be no voting as I said the spin meisters can manipulate too easily and I said Obama had a 35 member messaging team of some of the leading linguists the leading uh, influence people advertising executives creating every word that Obama said 
that whole statement about forward and you know invoking the Constitution that was going to appeal to the conservatives would mollify the conservatives. If he keeps talking about the Constitution and this is the way it's always been, that kind of language enabled him to be as progressive as he wanted, but f fool conservatives into thinking that he wasn't that liberal or radical. Uh, anyway. Um, they should be chosen passively in the same way as an index fund is, and that is, and it's just an example, these categories may not be, your legislature should consist of the teacher of the year, the cop of the year, the most cited philosopher of the year, um, the, most, uh, the, the, best, the most cited medical research of the year, and some random people so that it's the full panoply of the public. Of course it won't be perfect, but that's going to be a, it takes all the money, all the, f the, the flesh pressing, all of the obligations that a candidate then incurs when somebody makes a big donation, you're going to in general have better government. And that legislature, state and federal, would, 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 would select the, uh, the chief executive of that organization, of that jurisdiction. So for the state, it would be the, uh, it would be the governor. For a city, it would be the city council would pick the, uh, the mayor and the, uh, this, this Congress would, would select the president. Um, again, you know, the fox is guarding the hen house. The people who are the incumbents have a huge advantage, so they would never allow this. But that would make, in my judgment, a much better system of government. Now I want to talk about communism versus capitalism. Um, I have, I do feel, especially in an information age, which is really requiring a great deal of intelligence. And as well, there is such an increased financialization of our economy where so much money is made, not in creating products and services, but in exchanging money, whether it be cryptocurrency or the banks or lenders or, uh, or arbitragers or the amount of money made not by creating products and services is ridiculously huge. And that is, contributes to the the huge gap between rich and poor. So there is a piece of me that likes the idea of communism. The hell with all this profit. Let's, let's indeed make sure that everybody has at least a basic quality of life. And uh, let's plan the economy and put money where it's going to make the biggest difference to improve humankind, etc. Uh, and that would reduce some of the, that would reduce a lot of the gap between the haves and have nots. The problem with that is that every time the more equal we make things, the more we encourage the non-intrinsically self-motivated to not do a lot, to just take the minimum and suck at the system, and, uh, and, and, and that creates food shortages, it creates laziness, it creates drug abuse, and that's the problem with, with communism and indeed socialism, where, there's, where it's, um, it just too many, it creates too many disincentives to be productive human beings. And also it's meaningful to have work, but it's too tempting for a large part of the population who is not driven by productivity to just, you know, hang out um, or do the minimum. Look at all the, like I said, the just, re just released Gallup poll finds that more than 50% of workers are quiet quitting or doing the least they can get away with without being fired. And then... Um, capitalism. It's wonderful in that it really is what has created so much of the innovation from the mRNA vaccines against COVID to, uh, to the iPhone, to this webcam that I make near the internet, television, uh, the fact that I could buy baby aspirins for two pennies a piece, the fact that I can buy an incredibly reliable Toyota for an affordable amount of money, uh, I can buy a Whirlpool appliance, uh, Sony uh, audio equipment, um, at a four, these were not developed by the, by the public sector and they probably would not have been. And so, and there's abundance. Every time I go into the supermarket, I have an enormous choice of whatever. There's fresh fruit available all the time. There is a, a choice of, you know, everything from mayonnaise to canned peaches, um, all at uh, prices that most people can afford. Um, that's capitalism. And then there is the energy that tends to come from people who are incented to do well. You know, there's an energy, you walk around South of Market here in San Francisco, which is an epicenter for, for tech, and there's 
there's excitement. People are excited about their startup, about their new idea, what's going to happen next, how are we going to do this? You know, I, I, in contrast, I think back to the old Soviet Union where nobody cared about being an innovator. They just worried about, you know, how am I going to get my food, waiting in line, and, you know, and I'm seeing people here in the Bay Area, Bay Area, nobody dresses bright colors. Everybody just wants to go through. There's a real sadness. And I, I, I you know, I, I fear that quietly we're becoming like that as our society is getting ever more uh, paternalistic, ever more socialistic, ever more, it was something a few years ago that 48% of people are on some kind of social welfare in this country, and that was years ago. It seems like it's, it's increasing more, certainly as government gets bigger. I mean, the Biden administration and the Biden-Harris administration, and people like AOC and Ilhan Omar and the like, uh, are you know want to expand expand you know they're canceling student loans student loans are going to be paid off which only incents universities to raise prices more and for the people who did pay their student loans they're being the suckers at getting the who have paid and the taxpayer is going to be giving these people a free loan a free ride there's something really wrong about this very socialistic concept that they, these people signed up to, for the, to, they say, I'm going to go to this college and I'm going to pay this amount of money. And then, they, then they're then they now you know given a free ride on the benefit of the taxpayer. So that's why I like capitalism. And therefore, in balance, I am a moderate. I'm a mushy moderate. I do believe in, in lightly regulated capitalism and small government because government, because jobs are so, in, so secure, there's tendency to be a lot of go slow in government and a lot of bureaucracy to justify people's existence. So I am a fan of small government, it's basic safety net for all, but basic safety net, like the same kind of housing and food that's available for students at Harvard, that is group housing and group food, should be good enough for welfare recipients. I don't want anybody to starve, I don't want anybody on the streets. But I, it, it, doesn't, it seems wrong that the hardworking person who lives in a, in a modest apartment has to live the, no better than the person who stays on welfare, what they call the multi-generational welfare recipients. Now a word about relationships. Um, it's almost a miracle that the institution of marriage has lasted as long as it has. Uh, it's really unrealistic for two human beings, especially in a, in a feminist era where both men and women have more power to make all the compromises needed to stay together for life. Sexual, financial, where to live, how much to spend, how much to save, what to do. I think marriage is obsolete, period. I also think that having kids is one of the more self-sacrificial acts one can ever make. Whatever benefits derive from seeing your child grow up and the love and the caring for you in your old age is in many cases, I won't I don't even know, maybe most, who knows, outweighed by the decades of commitment, not just even 18 years, but 18 years of tremendous restriction of freedom and, uh, and, and increased cost. And increasingly with so many young people failing to launch disproportionately boys and young men i'll talk about that in a minute um it's a you know it can be a lifetime involvement and that's assuming your kid does not have a physical or mental disability uh tremendous sacrifice and there's still this tendency uh, some of this biological imperative you know i want to have a baby i feel i want to have a baby have a baby and then you know these you know on facebook all the moms you know generally it is the moms who hold their cute little baby and are smiling and happy and it makes people feel jealous. Let's keep up with the Janes, not the Joneses. Um, please think three times before having kids. Of course, from a societal perspective, if you'd be a great parent, great, you know, it's good for society, but it's asking too much of me to say, go have a kid to benefit society if you'd be potentially a good parent. Just one more word about relationships and that is family. There is another of these conventional wisdom that, it, that we should prioritize family over uh, friends. Um, we thrust in the family at random, and some, you know, some of it there is reason for you guys to be close. The experiences you had together, your genetic similarities, but so often there's at least one or more family members who have more trouble than they're worth, and yet we, by because of guilt, we feel this great responsibility. 
I would encourage you to uh, not reflexively prioritize family over friends whom you've chosen. Make the decision consciously. I'm worried about aging parents. My parents fortunately lived a long time. My father uh, lived to be 86 and suddenly died of stroke, so there was no real issue of uh, caretaking. My mom lived to be 89, and uh, her last couple of years were not good. And she lived in New York, where I grew up, and, uh, and I'm in California. And I made a, a, a decision which I feel really good about. It's very tempting, and many women particularly make this decision, to stop their work life to take care of their aging parent. I deliberately did not do that. I made the one-time effort to find the best damn caretaker I could. My mom wanted to die at home like most people. And I got a residential, paid her very well, spoke to her every day as well as my mom every day by phone. Uh, my mom did the Zoom. Um, and I felt good about it. She felt good about it. And I was a, I, you know, it didn't take so much time. It was fine. I created a wonderful life for Olga, the woman who uh, stayed with her 24 7 and the substitute person who I got when she needed time off. Um, I invite you to. Before you quit your life, and I literally mean that, quit your life to take care of an aging parent, think about whether it's wiser to do the uh, one-time effort to find amazing uh, care. And I made a lot of calls, call after call, for referrals, referrals, agencies, individuals, other older people, to find somebody awesome. And that was really worth doing. And then I treated her like the gold she was, paid her good money. And of course, she lived with you know, lived with my mom as well in, a, in her apartment in Flushing, Queens. Not a bad neighborhood, not great. Um, uh, and gave her gifts and expressed interest in her life. We spoke, every time I spoke to my mother every day, I spoke to Olga for a few minutes with care and respect. And that was for me and my mother. She was really happy about it and I was happy about it. And I encourage you to do that. Okay. Uh, the legal system. I'm just. This is just a list of things. I probably the order is not as good as it should be. But again, Lex Friedman, as I said, he, he's got two million followers. He flitted from thing to thing. Flits from thing to thing a lot. I don't like our legal system. It's based on who wins. You got these smart people being paid based on who they win. The judges and, and the jury of peers is not as competent as the people who are lawyers. I would replace our system of having two adversaries with something. I hear that there's a system in Europe that's like this, where there'd be three, uh, each case would have a neutral panel of three people. Instead of two lawyers and a judge, there would be three neutrals who divide up the work, and they are judged and paid based on the quality of their work, perhaps hired by the government or private companies, I don't know, but paid by the quality uh, of, the res of the work they did on the case, not who wins very important. Um, yeah, I did talk about the uh, uh, three C's. I don't need to talk about that anymore. Yeah, but one example of that, the three C's, the censorship, the censoring, the censuring, and the canceling that is pervading in the society and truncating what people can say and can't say, to, which I believe is profoundly to society's long-term uh, liability, because all wisdom does not right, reside left of center. Nor does it reside right of center, but it's the full panoply of well-derived ideas. I'm certainly not in favor of, you know, encouraging uh, Nazism or you know, mass murder, um, but there is a hell of a lot of good ideas from the left and the right which need to be allowed to, and encouraged to be given full voice. One of the examples of this that I can talk about is the, the gender issue. Men, boys are failing to launch terribly. I mentioned it briefly earlier. It used to be that 60% of college students in 1970 were, were male. That is now reversed, it's 40%. But when there was 60% male, there was billions of dollars of redress and complete reverse discrimination in many cases, I don't know about all, of course, to get more women. And now it's 60% women, yet nobody seems to care that it's 60% female, 40% male, and just people just shrug their shoulders. And how many disproportionately men Young men are back on their parents' sofa. I also see, when I, I take, I do a lot of walking and hiking, and I see these, when I see boys, they seem so, they're with their skateboards, they're with their, 
their comic book t-shirts, they seem like idiots. And the girls, you know, it's more like girls rock t-shirts. Girls can do anything t-shirts. There's much more confidence. And as the young men I'm seeing, when I started out as a career counselor 35 years ago, the men and the males and females seemed roughly equally optimistic, and they were optimistic about their futures. Now, disproportionately, whether it's my teenage boy clients or my older adult clients, um, the females still are spunky, alive, they feel the world is their oyster, and it is, and the males are either despondent or angry. Not all, but many. This is crazy. And of course, in the ultimate deficit, men die five years earlier than women, and they die earlier of each of the top 10 causes of the disease. Even though the rate of smoking, I believe, and drinking, and, and, uh, et cetera, are equal, roughly equal. Uh, but when, there, when women have a deficit, say there were fewer women engineers than men, there's been billions of dollars of redress. But when men have the ultimate deficit, they die five years earlier, which is you know, devastating to not only to them, but to their family. And failing health is, you know, is just a nightmare for these guys. Nobody cares. 95% of the, I did a review on PubMed, which is indexes thousands of medical journals, for 60 years. And 95% of the gender-specific medical research has been on women. And when women were excluded, which gets promoted by the media, it was only because it, the drug was, they didn't want women of pregnancy age to be trying a drug that could have destroyed the fetus, damaged the fetus. Really, there is a need for, I am not anti-woman at all. I'm very proud that my daughter is a Yale Law School graduate. She's an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, and she actually for, prosecutes sex crimes. I'm very proud of her accomplishments, and I'm glad that she did. I did everything I could to encourage her to be whatever she wanted to be. Uh, but I, I really think this is a time where there is great gender unfairness to men and boys, especially in the, in the uh, healthcare arena. It's endless reach outs to women in health, endless research. America, you know, men dropped out of heart attacks so much earlier, and yet the last heart initiative I saw was. Uh, uh, America was Coca-Cola at Kansas Women in Heart campaign, and uh, every time you see another run, it's for breast cancer, not prostate cancer. Anyway, so I, you know, that's uh, you know, you, I, I've been censured and censored and threatened, canceled for daring to say this. Definitely not anti-female, just gender fairness position. But social justice warriors, some of them are not about fairness, they're about their group, their community. I want to end this by talking a little bit about the future and an optimistic view of the f prediction for the future and a pessimistic one, and then what I think is my best shot, a realistic one. Of course, it's been said that he who lives by the crystal ball eats broken glass. Um, so, you know, take this for what it's worth, but it's my best shot. My optimistic vision is that technology and genetics specifically are going to help humankind a lot. I think genetics is going to cure most cancers or prevent them uh, and prevent retardation, which is at root the core of much multi-generational poverty and inability to succeed in, a, uh, in an information-centric society. Uh, I think technology will uh, I think automated cars will reduce and will reduce accidents. Accidents, and although yes, it will cost jobs, we have to figure out what to do about that. But I think there will be, uh, and I don't have a magic answer to the jobs question, but maybe there'll be greater attention to if there aren't jobs for people and they've tried. You know, and that's where I'm in. I am in favor of a, of a safety net, and for people who with you know who are able-bodied and try and still can't get a job, or even not able-bodied try and can't get a job. I am in favor of taxpayer paid, uh, hum reasonably humane safety net for them. Uh, more optimism. I am a believer, you know, even the left is agreeing this, that, that nuclear energy is going to be a major part of the real solution. Solar and wind are great, but they fit their physics to limitations preclude there being an adequate solution to our energy problems unless we go back and living, you know, like it's the 18th century, and we are therefore deprived of, you know, really important uh, electricity that enables to live a decent quality of life, uh, heat our homes, etc. Um, I think nuclear is an unlimited source of clean energy. I believe we will come up with solutions to the storage problem, and 
a level of safety far safer than uh, uh, well well within our time. There's nothing. And everything is a hundred percent safe, but safe enough that it, we we will there'll be consensus that it's worth using uh, nuclear energy, and that will be very good for the environment. No question about that, in my judgment. Um, also optimistic. I like to think that you know maybe 20, 30 years from now. The, uh, the unions won't have such a stranglehold on education and that real innovation along the lines I described, these individualized modules taught online by these world-class teachers filled with simulations will uh, be a, a much better way for kids to learn and therefore we'd be better citizens, more productive in terms of inventing, implementing better customer service, better political leaders. Uh, and I think you know we'll eventually have to get fed up with this horrible system that would allow a Donald Trump to get elected, who should not have been the President of the United States, nor Joseph Biden, nor many of the people who get elected. They're very often longer on personality than on substance, and they lack the wisdom that is required uh, to lead a complicated entity like a government. Uh, so I believe we'll get to that point, and that's why I really do like my idea of the uh, more passively selected, like index funds, like I said, teacher of the year, cop of the year, philosopher of the year, scientist of the year, and random people being our legislators who would then pick our uh, states and federal executives. So I like to think that uh, those are bases, bases for optimism. I don't even feel like talking about the dystopian. There's a chance that, you know, you know, another Hitler will, will be armed with nuclear weapons and bioweapons will take over the world. Um, it could happen. I uh, can't say it can't. I have no idea. I don't think any responsible person could assign probabilities to that. Uh, it could be that they, you know, we're ever more polarized. It could be race wars, uh, gender wars, fought either with our ever more miniaturized, more powerful weapons, or just weapons of words. Words are very powerful, as we see. The social media can destroy people. Uh, but, you know. I do like Obama's statement, you know, uh, we may take steps forward, steps back, but inevitably it's forward. I've just baudlerized his uh, quote, but I like it. And I think on that note, that is a great way for us to end. Anyway, if by any chance you've watched through this almost hour worth of my uh, my thoughts, trying to essentially be, in, uh, be inspired by Lex Friedman with his two million views, these are some of my, my thoughts flitting from thing to thing like he does. And as usual, I would uh, welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you would hit the share button and share this video or audio uh, with your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. And I'm also, I just have two new books out in the last couple of months. I invite you to go to Amazon to look at Jeremy's Quests, subtitle, Success Starting Out. And the other is Soloists, uh, 123 short, short stories of introverts and outsiders facing a dilemma. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.